Welcome to the United Nations Global Compact Academy. I'm Lisa Kingo, the CEO and Executive Director of the Compact. Today's session is on what human rights mean for business. And it's my huge pleasure to welcome our guest uh, for the Academy today, um, who is the uh, UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights. Said Rad Al Hussein is with us today, and it's indeed a great honor and a great uh, pleasure. Um, some months ago, um, Said launched a new campaign to celebrate the fact that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has its 17 year anniversary this year. So across the world, the UN Global Compact is supporting this campaign with many different uh, initiatives on the human rights across all our local networks globally. And we are calling on all companies to focus on the human rights declaration. So what is the status of human rights among Global Compact companies these days? In our recent survey, um, it was very impressive to see that 90% of participating companies have a policy in place on human rights. But only 15% has targets, performance indicators, or impact analysis. So there is still a lot of work to be done going forward. So, so Saad, I, I think we should dive into it now. And let me kick off this academy by asking you from, from your position, what you think are the most pressing human rights issues in the world today? Well, the most pressing issue, and first of all, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to join you and your uh, audience. Uh, the most pressing issues are obviously the most extreme violations uh, of uh, people's rights uh, across the globe. And it's uh, really upon, it falls upon governments to ensure that uh, they uphold those rights because they've created the legal framework and they themselves have voluntarily entered into obligations. And, and the role of business is in essence to ensure that uh, governments are not violating those obligations by dint of some contractual arrangement with a particular uh, company or investment. And, and so we need to partner uh, through the global, global compact uh, with our companies throughout the world to ensure uh, not just for the sake of their own reputations, but the very societies in which they operate, uh, that it's all a healthy environment and not a destructive one. And, and, and basically companies can make a decision either to be to be positive about these issues and to ensure that when it comes to social and environmental impacts that there are mitigating factors there, uh, or not to be so and then risk their reputations and possibly uh, ruin uh, their investments because of carelessness or inattentiveness to these issues altogether. Said, I think you, you are pointing out very clearly what a hugely important role governments have to play in actually making sure that the Universal Declaration on Human Rights are really anchored in all nations across the world. Uh, I'm also keen to hear your perspective on the role of business. I mean, in today's world, where do you see the biggest challenges for, for companies that are, that are working internationally and, and really want to address human rights in, in a responsible way? Well, I, the starting point is that the Universal Declaration is a framework. It's a, it's a beautifully written document that lays out principles that are applicable everywhere. And just as we speak of a globalized world, a world that's highly integrated, whether we talk about capital flows 
or the way in which uh, supply chains extend uh, for companies uh, in many, many parts of the world, many markets, uh, it's a, there's a natural coming together of all of this. And unless we have a somewhat stable, regulated world, uh, then it's not just business that suffers, but the very uh, existence of humanity that could be uh, at stake. Uh, it is important, I think, to realize that within the Universal Declaration, there are uh, articles that have direct, a direct relevance to business. Uh, for example, uh, freedom of movement. I mean, it uh, translates directly to freedom of movement of labor. Uh, you have freedom of association. Uh, of course, this is the, the right to form unions and collective bargaining. We have uh, the principle of non-discrimination which essentially means equal pay. It means ending discrimination against the minority group, so for instance, the LGBTI community. Uh, and so there's a whole range of principles and articles covered in the um, Universal Declaration that have uh, a direct applicability to the world of business uh, today. And so the more that we can develop this way of thinking inside the uh, corporate boardrooms of uh, this world, uh, the better off they will be and uh, we will be all together in terms of seeing uh, business grow and prosper and uh, serve people, uh, not undermine their rights, which is the last thing that we'd want to see. Um, Saad, uh, you, you almost began to, to go through the guiding principles on business and human rights that many global compact companies uh, see as a, a great tool to help um, do a systematic approach on, on, on human rights across an organization. So I'm, I'm interested in how you see um, very important tools uh, and guidelines like uh, the business guide, but also uh, the global goals. I mean, what, what is the relation between human rights and the global goals in your mind? Well, I think you spoke uh, at the very beginning that there is a sort of tendency and inclination for businesses and business leaders to want to be seen to be doing the right thing uh, and not to be seen by their families, friends, associates, uh, those they work with as being involved in a shabby uh, sort of enterprise. No one wants to, you know, most people don't want to live with that reputation. So the question boils down to one of commitment and awareness. Your uh, statistical representation at the beginning of this uh, interview or discussion showed that there is an inclination toward this, but those who actually then follow through with a human rights mapping exercise, uh, a human rights due diligence policy, um, knowing exactly uh, where the risks may uh, lie for a particular business. Is it in the uh, weak regulatory environment? Uh, is it in the nature of the business itself, the technologies, for instance? And uh, an awareness of the, uh, the sort of the uh, legal rules that underpin uh, human rights is fundamentally important. What we would like to see is an, a continuation of companies uh, believing that this is good for them, join uh, the guiding principle, sign on. We have 12,000 companies around from 160 countries that have signed on. We want to see more and, and then follow through with a commitment on really trying to understand uh, the, the extent of uh, their global supply chain and, and what the impacts are, and then coming up with some good measures to ensure that uh, the, if there are any violations uh, or if the, the state in which they're operating in is clearly in violation, that there's some remedy to this. And, and Lisa, I think it's important to point out that those companies that are proactive are really the smart companies. I, I can tell you, for instance, I was speaking to the general counsel of a company and uh, who essentially wasn't taking us seriously, wasn't taking me seriously. You know, I, I have that from my family. I don't need it from a general counsel of the company. And, uh, and only a few weeks after we met, 
there was a major news, uh, a news story about this company. And uh, basically, they were being beaten by a stick. And at that stage, the company then called us back to have a, a serious discussion. Well, we could have had that serious discussion before the story broke. And, and so what you want is a proactive, serious, dedicated discussion. Those are the smart business leaders. Those are the smart CEOs. And uh, I think if you're behind the curve and your understanding of risk is very limited, uh, you stand to lose in the, in the, in the century that uh, we're, we're making headway into. Uh, Said, that's a very, very good example of how useful it is for companies to be proactive when it comes to human rights. And you know that at the UN Global Compact, our foundation uh, is the 10 principles that, of course, include human rights. And we are also very busy creating awareness across the world about the global goals. And I cannot resist this opportunity to ask you if, if you have any favorites among the global goals that you think promote and uh, really need to be underpinned by human rights in a very special way? No, I, I think they're all important, Lisa. I, you know, I, I, you, you get me into trouble when you ask these sorts of questions. <laughs> they're all important. They're all important. And, and I think the dedication up front uh, shows. I mean, when you look at the world today and, and look at where, where talent is going, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed when you have a, a company that's thriving and interviewing talented potential employees. The company believes, the HR department believes that it, it's interviewing you know, a bright 21-year-old. In actual fact, it's the 21-year-old that's interviewing the company because talent will go where they believe the uh, leadership is enlightened. And that has been the story of the historical narrative of the human experience. Where leadership is enlightened, talent will go. Where leadership is not, they, they certainly may, may do well as a business, but that's not where the best people will go. And I think what we need to see is not just a sort of legalistic understanding of what's important, but a real determination to do the right thing. And I'll give you an example. I was speaking to a, a prominent um, manager of a private equity firm and uh, who conveyed a story to me about the discussion with his son. And he said his son was rather upset at what uh, the father's firm was doing and was under the impression that the father, all he did was build equity into firms by removing and rendering redundant a large number of employees. And so the, the father called me up and said, you know, I don't want to be seen by my son as someone who's not actually providing a good and a service and doing something good in, in terms of my investing. And I think that's what we need to see. We need to see the sort of lights come on and, and people to realize that the guiding principles, the goals, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aid. It's not, a, it's not the, you know, the a sort of rail, it's an aid. And we, just to help facilitate having the lights come on and realizing that in actual fact, good business and sound investing really depends on getting this right. And it's a bit harder to do, but like all leadership, good leadership is hard. And the dividends though are considerable in the long term. Yeah. Mm. Well, well that, that, that's a very good point. Um, I, I think you raised such an important issue in talking about the young people, the next generation, and what they will require from their future employers. And there's just a big study uh, that has come out recently from one of the big uh, consultancies that are giving a very consistent picture that young people today, between 18 and 24, when they go looking for a job, they wanna work for a company that they can identify themselves with, that have the same kind of values as they have themselves, and the same kinds of visions for the world. And companies that are sort of driven by, you know, the 
the, the, the good old, the business of business is business, may not be at the top of, of these young people's wish list. So, so Saad, in, in, in your perspective, what do you think will happen when the next generation takes the lead in, in our society, uh, not least in the human rights area? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely, Lisa. I mean, I just anecdotally, whenever I go to universities, I, you know, the millennial generation is very uh, determined to see that all their rights are being honored. I mean, there's a great uh, sort of unawareness with a large part of the public out there about how important rights are, because often in many countries where those uh, rights are guaranteed by law, you're unaware of them. You only become aware of them when you're deprived of them and suddenly you realize how important they are to uh, sustaining a, a dignified life. And I think you're right. I mean, young people, talented young people, uh, have, uh, can choose where they want to go. And uh, again, I think uh, those particular companies that are not doing it for a tick the box exercise, and there are many of those. I mean, let's be fair, there are many of those perhaps even in the Global Compact, or, or those who've signed on to the guiding principles, that just see it as a means of just padding out the possibility, just it's a sort of risk mitigation exercise. But there are many others who actually take them very seriously. They realize it's not just ticking the box and a public relations exercise and so forth. And I think those are the smart ones. And those are the ones that are going to attract. Those are the ones that are not just business leaders and corporate leaders, but they are leaders leaders in their own right and if i was a young person and i wish i was i'd have to think back into century <laughs> when i was a young person that's the sort of leader i want to work with the she or he or they that represent the very best in us human beings that provide a good a service to a community through their business activities and that think universal values and that's the person i want to work for well, I, I, I certainly completely agree with you. And, and, and Said, we, we, we should not forget that we have a big audience for our academy and our conversation today. Well, I and hope I haven't like offended to, anyone. <laughs> I, I would like to take the opportunity to bring one of the questions that we have had from um, one of our audiences uh, into, into our program. And um, that's my first asking for examples of how businesses are partnering with other organizations in the human rights community. And I think it's a very good question because goal number 17 on partnerships is so important. So Saad, would you have an example to share with us on a company that are working with uh, one or more uh, organizations within the human rights field? Well, there are, uh, clearly you have in the humanitarian field, for example, uh, there, we were told recently by the head of the World Food Program how in terms of the distribution of humanitarian aid, they're relying more and more on, on blockchains and uh, working with uh, artificial intelligence to uh, make sure that the delivery is as effective and efficient as possible. Uh, from the human rights perspective, we do rely more on technology than we did before and tech uh, companies that provide it uh, when we are doing investigations into gross uh, human rights abuses. And, and those sorts of partnerships, I think, are extremely important. Uh, for example, we have a, a partnership also with Microsoft and they're helping us develop a dashboard. Um, we have had an intensive discussion with them as a leader in the technology field about where technology is going. Um, and I think it's important to uh, sort of have this partnership at an early stage uh, because uh, hitherto there is this belief that uh, as technology uh, expands into areas of human experience that we haven't yet tapped, that we have to invent new laws. In actual fact, the laws that we have are pretty good 
and they are the sum of human experience up until now. And, and what we see now is not that different from what we've seen before in, in previous technological expansions. It's just the rate of expansion is so much faster. And the thing to realize is that what we have can be adapted to ensure that uh, technology and human rights uh, are uh, moving in, in a synchronized fashion and, and those sorts of relationships, in the same way that my office has a relationship with Microsoft, we want to expand uh, with many, many uh, other uh, corporate uh, entities, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. not just in technology, but elsewhere as well. Yeah. Um, but, but that's a great example. Um, thank you very much for that. I mean, Saad, I, I, I think um, now you inspired me to sort of thinking about the digital age and the future of the world, decent work in an age where technology will become more and more dominant. I mean, what, what is your thinking on how human rights will develop in a digital world? And what role human rights will play and which forms it might take in such a high tech and digital world? Yes, I mean, that you raise in, a, a question, in, in your question some very serious issues which would be impossible for me to grasp in only a few minutes. Uh, but you, there is a very po a great possibility that as machine learning and AI advance and as blockchains become more sophisticated and the algorithms become more sophisticated, that uh, in the pursuit of efficiency and reduced cost, um, we render parts of uh, traditional labor markets uh, redundant and then you move towards a, compa a compulsory national wage. And that, of course, then is great. There's a problem there because if in the pursuit of this, we have more and more people out of work and, and the decent, uh, uh, you know, the right to a decent, you know, to decent work basically is, is emasculated we face the possibility that in 35, 50 years, you might have a, a global north where people are asking the existential question of why do we exist? We're not producing any good. We're not producing any service. We're being paid by the state to spend the money. And then you might see a sort of sanatorium in the north. In the global south, we will have desperation uh, in a manner that we've never seen uh, before in the context of people really struggling to cope. Um, and so the human rights dimensions, if we are to offset this, uh, must be grasped with a, a some sense of urgency. We do see a, a, a backtracking. And I don't think it's a world we want to live in, a world filled with walls, a world filled with hatred, and, uh, and the rapacious competition. We want to see a world that everyone, every business, every human being uh, can, can thrive and not at the expense of another. Now, finally, I mean, it does create inter interesting dynamics. As I said earlier, you know, there are UN, UN entities that are using modern technology. But we must also ask the question that in, in the context of a UN humanitarian operation, while that technology may reduce cost for the UN or for, let's say, a service provider, a particular business that's contracted with the UN, we may also lose something else, though. We may lose the interaction with the local community who traditionally would have to depend on for, that, uh, for enabling that service to reach a particular community. And so we need to have this sort of sentinel where we're watching all these activities and providing advice, encouraging growth, encouraging technology, but also having uh, and shaping a sort of wisdom around where all of this is headed. And I think that's, that's also challenging. And we see now a number of different uh, initiatives in this area. But I, I, what I would like to insist upon is that it's not just you know, um, a sort of a dreaming about what the world could be but it's basing it and anchoring it on the laws that we already have in place, which are pretty good. They're pretty good. Well, 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 absolutely. And and um, uh, Said, I, I think your your ideas about being very aware of 
the impacts of the digital world already now and beginning to think about how we can map that out in the best possible way is very, very interesting. And it just made me think about a couple of numbers, uh, which is that I believe we will need like 600 million new jobs by 2030 to make sure that we really give, give everyone an opportunity to have a job that can sustain people's lives. We also have a situation where 1.8 a billion young people today are without school or education. So, I mean, I think the world needs to be pretty innovative uh, in, in, in solving these, these themes. And, I mean, in, in, in terms of the young people, again, I mean, where would you take a starting point? Well, I think it's, it's to ensure that when you're creating these technologies, that you are aware of the downsides, the downstream risks that the technologies are, uh, are uh, lending themselves to. And uh, at the engineering stage, uh, if we're talking about the digital technologies, it comes at a fairly early start in life. I mean, most young engineers are in their early 20s and, and uh, you know, their understanding perhaps of the world is fresh and not necessarily, as, and perhaps it's a good thing. Perhaps it's, you know, when you look at people at least my age, you'll see these dinosaurs and ossified human beings. On the other hand, we have the, the, the benefit of, of understanding how complex this world is and that if we can pass that along, not to, not to limit their aspirations, but just to make them more aware that what they're creating you know, can be of great help to humanity. But at the same time, if you're working on surveillance equipment and the company is selling the surveillance equipment to a country where it's known, it's known that it has a terrible human rights record. I mean, you, you are then a willing partner in, in ensuring, not the engineer who produces the, mission, the particular equipment, but the sales rep or the marketing uh, you know, executive or whoever is higher up who is making these decisions. And I think that's what ultimately we believe the millennial generation will begin to question and will begin to ask, do we really need market share in this part of the world where it's very well known how this equipment may well then be used? And I think it's this broader awareness. So by all means, develop the technology to its nth extent but be aware of where it may go. And then if, if you can build into this, then uh, mitigating factors, this would be, or mitigating uh, um, parts of, at least mitigating uh, algorithms, let's say, then you, then you uh, prevent the worst from happening. And, and that's really the story of humankind in any case. I mean, we've seen progress ever since we came out of a cave uh, 200,000 years ago, and we're upright 8,000 years ago. And uh, I'm trying to get rid of war and conflict and bitterness and hatred. And, and so there is no, I don't think it's, it's just accelerating. And with it, we have to be, uh, I think, ever more vigilant, but also encouraging of it. Absolutely. And I think for the first time ever in human history, we actually have a common agenda of 17 amazing goals. So. We know exactly what to do. Now we just need to mobilize everyone in our society to, to go ahead and do it. Um, but I have had one more question from uh, our audience that, that are keen to uh, understand uh, how companies might help bridge the gender digital divide. And if you consider this a human rights issue, Yes, I, I mean, what exists in the digital space is a reflection of what exists beyond it or before it. And, and clearly, in most, if not all, societies, I mean, barring a few exceptions, the challenges are considerable. I mean, absolutely considerable. And it's, uh, it's still astonishing to me in, in those societies which have uh, almost for a century have 
uh, open the space for for women to participate in all walks of, of the human experience, um, how still we have uh, inequalities, discrimination, gender disparity when it comes to pay uh, for equal work. I mean, it is almost mind boggling because the, the, the remedy is so obvious. It's just good leadership, enlightened leadership. Why discriminate against any, any person? I mean, the special part of us is the fact that we're all human beings. It's not the color that we uh, attribute to our skin tone or the color of our eyes or the hair that we have on our heads or the lack thereof in my case. It is something much more than that. We are all human beings. We have inalienable rights. Understand it, support it. You know, be a, be a real leader. And that's, I think, ultimately what we're trying to say, either through the SDGs, the 17 goals, uh, to the heads of state or government, or through the guiding principles where we invite companies to, to join us in this. Um, but it, the, the, the prescription is the same, non-discrimination, non-deprivation. We don't want to deprive anyone. We don't want to put anyone in a condition of fear either, either in the workplace uh, or uh, indeed in, in whatever country that person works and operates. And I think here we, we have seen advances. I mean, we, um, uh, we have uh, promulgated a, a publication on standards of conduct for companies when it comes to the LGBTI uh, uh, community. And, um, and we've made in incredible progress. I mean, when I first, we first began to discuss this in Davos uh, a couple of years ago, the attendance was quite uh, limited, modest. Uh, we weren't really in the center of the discussion in Davos. And uh, last year we were, and the number of companies that were interested uh, in increased markedly from where we were a few years ago. And, and so there is an appetite here. It's just a question of making sure that others are aware in all the different segments in which uh, business pervades uh, uh, human experience and then, and then helping and assisting those companies when it comes to their operations and uh, value chains. And I think, uh, and uh, so I think for us, it is an exciting story, but it's a quite a challenging one too. Um, thank you for bringing the issue of leadership up. I, I think it's absolutely central to the moment in history we are in today, to implementing human rights and the global goals, that we look for real leadership and people who have the courage and the passion to drive this agenda forward, both in the existing generation, but definitely also in, in the future generations. And, and Said, I mean, you are such an amazing leader and so inspiring to, to all of us in the whole human rights arena. And maybe as a final question to you, um, I would like you to talk a little bit about how companies can take action in support of the 17 year anniversary for the, U, uh, for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That, that you are driving this year from, from uh, your organization? I think be a good role model. Uh, when you're thinking of your company's operations and you're thinking about uh, expanding market share, you're thinking about share price, you're thinking about keeping your shareholders on board, but think about your own reputation as a human being. Ultimately, you want to be seen as a, as a leader who is, has drawn the admiration, again, not, of the, not just of that immediate community, but of your family, of your children, as someone who stood up for the rights, not just of a particular community from whence you came, but all human beings. I mean, and this is the fundamental difference between an extremist, and an extremist could be a politician, it could be, it could be uh, an activist, it could be a business leader and a human rights defender could be all of those as well, but a business right, a sort of human rights defender cares about the rights of everyone, of everyone, not just uh, an immediate community. And I think if you're a business leader and you want the very best talent and you want to be respected, 
and you want to be on the right side of the curve. You don't want to be embroiled in difficulties when it comes to production delays and, and acquiring permits because you didn't uh, consult the community properly when it came to a particular investment and then you're involved in a social conflict and with violence. That you don't want to be involved with. And you in, in, eventually, as we've seen time and again, the investment is pulled. Uh, you want to be proactive. You want to see beyond the immediate horizon. And I think uh, the more we see that, the more encouraged we are that our children will be working for companies, will be involved in services that are fundamentally ethical. Not ethical, just uh, as I said, as a window dressing exercise, but really ethical. And, uh, and that the, you know, the employer and the employee will feel bound together in a common spirit of serving humanity. And I think that's what we want to see. Well, that, that, that's very strong words. And I think a, a perfect way of, of wrapping up uh, our session today. Um, so I'd thank you so much for, for sharing uh, your thinking with us within the human rights area. It's so amazing. We are, we are celebrating this year a declaration that is 70 years old. It has probably never been more relevant today. Um, and from the UN Global Compact, we are right behind you in your campaign. We are organizing CEO roundtables across the world on human rights. Um, the most recent one was in Argentina. And we will gather all our learnings from across the world in a major CEO roundtable on inequality and human rights that we will host on the 24th of September uh, in New York. And I know that there will also be a celebration, the anniversary celebration on the 10th of December. So this is in every way a year of celebrating the fundamental importance of the Declaration of, of Human Rights. Um, I hope that um, all our participants have enjoyed uh, the session. I hope you will take a couple of minutes uh, after the session to let us know uh, if the session was useful uh, for you. And we will be back from the United Nations Global Compact Academy again on the 14th of uh, June where we are so fortunate that Patricia Espinosa, the chief of the UNFCCC, will be in the studio with us discussing the challenges uh, around climate change. So with these words, I thank you, Said, so much for participating today. And we will definitely get back on human rights and this anniversary celebration on many more occasions. Thank you.